YouTube channel as well. So welcome everybody to the December 20th installment of the PMRA volunteers meeting. Um, Jonathan Fisher here, your, your erstwhile host. And we've got a special guest today, Dr. Rob Leachman, we'll get to in a minute. First, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Howes of the Sumter Valley. I saw in my NRHS newsletter yesterday, Steve, that um, Sumter Valley got a grant to work on its archive. And I understand that this is one of several grants, generous grants that you folks have received. And why don't you tell us a little bit about the support you guys are receiving? Sure. Um, well, um, the archives effort of Sumter Valley Railroad has been around since its inception back in uh, 1971. And the majority of our, it sort of took the background for a while, but uh, we got a big infusion of cash when uh, our uh, unofficial historian, uh, a fellow by the name of Ron Har, who used to work for the SP, lived in Eugene. Uh, he had a, a very large interest in the Sumter Valley, did a lot of research while watching grades and everything. And when he retired, he bought a, uh, a home in, in the town of Sumter. And when he passed away, Got it. he um, donated uh, the proceeds from the sale of his property to the railroad. And that gave us uh, about $150,000 to start with. And we finally got around to uh, several years ago, we actually started the construction of our archives building at our yard facility in McEwen. Uh, $150,000, of course, wasn't enough to cover the um, entire uh, cost of construction. And of course, it's changed as we went along. So we did uh, some uh, applications for grants and we were successful. The first one that came in was one from the NRHS and it was in the amount of $4,600. It was uh, a matching grant. So um, we took some of the money we had and put with it. And uh, uh, most of the money initially just went for the, the floor and the framing of the building. And uh, subsequently uh, the NRHS grant, uh, I believe came in several months ago. Uh, since then, we've gotten a $7,000 grant from the uh, uh, state of Oregon. I'm not sure exactly what agency it came from, but I looked at our last financial report and it said parks and recreation on it. But um, regardless, it was a $7,000 infusion that uh, was very helpful. We also got it uh, $10,000 from uh, Union Pacific Foundation. And then just recently, we got a um, $5,200 grant from the Leo Adler Foundation, which is a uh, charitable uh, foundation that was founded by a older gentleman who has since passed away, but he uh, made his fortune, lived in Baker City, uh, selling magazines. And he's been become known as uh, Uncle Leo around the uh, city of Baker City because he is, his foundation has supported uh, many, many projects around the uh, varied projects around the Baker County area and elsewhere. And then uh, also since then, we've gotten a couple of $5,000 donations, uh, other smaller ones. And as a result, it looks like we're going to have the funds in place to go ahead and mm -hmm have the building completed sometime this spring or, or summer. The uh, grant from the Leo Adler Foundation is gonna go towards um, purchasing shelving, furniture and that sort of thing, uh, file cabinets, you know, making sure we have everything we need to uh, keep all of our uh, artifacts and documents, photographs, maps, and in safe storage. And uh, right now they've just finished up. Uh, they still have a little bit left to do on the interior, but we've got the uh, HVAC and heat, uh, um, windows, uh, securities uh, features all <clears throat> in place. And I think this spring and summer, those of us that work on the Ar archives committee will have quite a, quite a workload in moving all of our materials from enterprise where they are now down to McEwen, and hopefully some of you folks will have the opportunity to come over, see our archives project, and maybe ride the train while you're there. 
Fantastic. Thanks for the update, Steve. And it's good to hear that you guys have got enough funding to be able to complete, you know, this initial level of creating a physical archive for all the cool stuff that you guys have got over there at Sumter Valley. We're looking forward to uh, getting it all in place and, and having it where we can show the public and uh, possibly get more support for our organization and um, get material out there that a lot of people haven't seen before. Great. Well, you know, um, Steve, this is actually a really great segue because, you know, we are reaching the end of the year. And those of you that have been out there that have had a good year and in life has been good, why not take a minute and support a heritage organization of your interest and your support and, and help those organizations like here at the Sumter Valley and, and, and some of the other institutions that we help support. You know, Cascade Rail Foundation, of course, is mine, but you know, um, support a local history organization with a little bit of your, you know, kind of that couch change kind of stuff, you know? So uh, <laughs> just a plug to, to, for a little charitable giving at your end. We're going to get started in a second. I just want to just quickly go over um, our coming events for the next, uh, oh, roughly month and a half or so. Our next program, January 3rd, 2024, I'm, as I'm getting ready to start saying that, will be Chuck Soul, and Chuck Soul will be presenting Northern Pacific Thurston County history. On January 13th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, we've got a live event that will be streamed with a famed Northern Pacific retired engineer, Jack Christensen. Jack Christensen will be talking about driving passenger trains out to Grays Harbor. So that's going to be a fun one. Uh, we'll be doing that in conjunction with the NPRHA and the Highline Heritage Museum. January 17th, Mark Borleski, uh, Cascade Rail Foundation board member, will be presenting on the efforts that uh, CRF has gone through with Washington State Parks to um, you know, rehabilitate some of these bridges in Eastern Washington. Dr. Leachman's very familiar with some of these bridges. And, and they are now open, and George, of course, are now open for the, um, the public. Um, Trent says, renew those annual memberships in your favorite organization. That's absolutely right. January 31st, we have um, Dr. Uh, excuse, well, Professor Doug Oakman, emeritus from Pacific Lutheran University, and he will be presenting on... Morris Code and the Morris Telegraph Club in the Puget Sound area. And then February 14th, uh, a favorite of our programming for sure, uh, Mike Bergman will be back and Mike will be talking about streetcars somewhere. You know, Mike's passion is, is uh, transit and he's very good at teasing this stuff out. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over Professor Leachman, Dr. Rob Leachman, University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Leachman, tell us a little bit about yourself, about the UPHS, and sir, the program is all yours. We're honored to have you here today, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. Let me share my screen because the things you requested will be in there. <clears throat> Okay, can we all see that? Yeah, I know where you're at here. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, George is probably driving some of these trains, aren't you, George? Oh, I do that. these are these are old stuff. They're before he got there, but I'm sure he's been over every inch of the track. All right, so, so it's all yours. Okay, so uh, some of you I know. Nice to see you again. Some of you I probably am a new face too. So I'll give you a quick introduction. Um, my dad was a Portland-based plywood and lumber broker. Uh, he was responsible for many of the roller lumber loads on the railroads. So he was a very big customer of all three of the railroads in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, among his friends was the general manager of UP's Northwestern District, George Baker. And my dad said, you know, I have a son going to college who's really interested in the railroads. Can he get a summer job? <laughs> um, and so uh, I remember when I came to the superintendent's office, office in Albina Yard in Portland. And uh, I 
I noticed at written on the top of my application was a handwritten note that said, uh, this man is a personal friend of the general manager. He should be hired immediately. So it wasn't what I know, it was who I knew that got me started on the UP. Uh, but I got summer jobs working as a telegrapher, operator, and agent uh, during the summers in college, 70 through 73, and then ran all around the Oregon division in Oregon, Washington, Idaho. In particular, uh, one of my first jobs in the summer of 70 was the, the night ticket clerk operator at Baker, Oregon. Uh, and I can still remember in the weeds and under the bushes, there was three rail track uh, from when traffic was transloaded from the Sumter Valley to the UP. Any rate, after college, I took a job in the headquarters in Omaha in the newly formed service planning group. Uh, and uh, we were a new group, kind of the interface between traffic and operations. And the railroad didn't know what to do with us, so we made up our own project. So it was a lot of fun. I did that for a couple of years, uh, then uh, went to grad school and uh, uh, the railroad begged me to come back uh, during the summer break of my first year of grad school. So I went back up to Hinkle as car distributor to uh, help them implement some of the stuff I designed when I was in Omaha. Uh, and then I came back to grad school, finished a PhD and became a professor at Berkeley. Um, so on the side of being a professor, I also have a consulting firm, Leachman and Associates, uh, and we provide consulting and software for manufacturing, supply chain, and rail operations analysis. And uh, we, our clients have been corporations and government agencies worldwide. Um, this year, I retired from UC Berkeley, um, but I continue to teach one class voluntarily per year in retirement, and I still have grad student and research grants. So I still have uh, research projects and still running the consulting business. Uh, I joined the board of the UP Historical Society in 2012 and in 2022, I became president. Uh, and just, so just a little blurb on the UPHS, uh, founded in 1984, it's independent of the railroad nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and sharing uh, the history of the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, if you sign up to be a member, you receive our quarterly magazine, The Streamliner. Uh, if you sign up at the sustaining or preservation level, uh, you also get our calendar and you can go to uphs.org uh, to read all about it. Um, we hold a, an annual convention, including field trips and presentations uh, related to UP history. Our uh, 2024 convention will be May 11 down at the Southern California Railway Museum. We'll focus on the UP in Southern California. Uh, and we also are growing an archive of uh, historic UP photos and paperwork, uh, which we maintain at the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming. Uh, and uh, from time to time, we publish books on UP history. Uh, and you can see what we have available at, at our online company store at the uphs.org site. So what you're about to watch is a presentation I gave at our 2023 convention, which was in Pasco, Washington. So it was focused on UP in the Northwest. Uh, and the contents of this presentation uh, will appear as an article in a future issue of the Streamliner. Okay, so here we go. Uh, many of you know the UP Oregon Division, but as a quick primer for uh, those maybe who haven't followed it. I have a little map there with the main lines a little heavier than the branch lines. Uh, coming uh, from the Idaho border, going west from Huntington, Oregon, the first subdivision extends to LaGrande, uh, and there are grades both directions, and then the second sub from LaGrande to Hinkle. Uh, and those two subdivisions uh, uh, were affectionately referred to as the mountain. Uh, then going down the gorge, you have the third sub to the Dalles and the fourth sub continuing from the Dalles to Albina Yard in Portland. Uh, and they were collectively known as the Sandy. Uh, then going north on BN and Milwaukee trackage rights to Seattle uh, was the north end. Uh, and then from Hinkle over to Spokane was uh, the sixth sub uh, or the Washi. Uh, and then uh, north of Spokane was uh, uh, the Spokane International the subsidiary railroad UP bought in 1958 was pretty much a branch line in the 1970s. It's uh, become much more of a main line uh, in recent years. 
Uh, and then jointly owned with uh, BN was the Camas Prairie uh, from Ruperia over uh, to Lewiston and beyond. Okay, we're going to focus on the Blue Mountains section, and I'm going to cover a little bit of the history of how the railroad ended up there. Uh, and you can kind of see uh, uh, Umatilla on the Columbia at the upper left and Huntington at the lower right. And we're going to be talking about that piece of railroad. This is a map from the 1920s of the Oregon Washington Railroad and Navigation. Okay, so our history starts with this fellow uh, uh, who was born Ferdinand Heinrich Gustav Hilgard. Uh, and uh, when he clandestinely uh, emigrated uh, to the U.S. without his parents' knowledge, he changed his name to Henry Villard, one of his classmates at boarding school in France. Uh, and uh, uh, he got into finance and Wall Street. And uh, uh, with his connections back to Germany, he uh, represented a lot of German bondholders. There have been a lot of German investors in uh, companies in the Pacific Northwest. In particular, uh, they had the majority of the bonds in the Oregon Steamship Company and the Oregon and California Railroad. Both went under. Uh, and so in 1875, he took control of those companies on behalf of the bondholders. A few years later, he acquired the Oregon Steam Navigation Company, which was operating a fleet of steamers and a couple of portage railroads along the Columbia River. Uh, and he renamed the company as the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company, ORNN. Uh, and he saw that railroads were the wave of the future and it would make steamboats obsolete. Uh, so he directed the ORNN to build a rail line along the south bank of the Columbia from Portland to Wallula, uh, where the Northern Pacific was uh, building eastward uh, to their Transcon charter. They had a charter to build from the Great Lakes to Puget Sound. Uh, but they'd struggled financially, and they'd only built west from Carleton, Minnesota, near Duluth, to the Missouri River, and only a little ways east from Wallula. Uh, and Villard hoped to convince them that you should use my OR and N line through the, along the Columbia River rather than try to build over the Cascades to fulfill your charter. Uh, uh, but the NP management wasn't thrilled with that idea, and he couldn't get a deal. Uh, and he was afraid that if they did build west, then nobody would use his ORNN. Uh, so he organized a blind pool of East Coast and German investors, and he gained control of the NP. And in 81, he became the NP president. Uh, and so at that point, he was financing simultaneous construction of the Oregon and California from Roseburg down to Ashland, and the ORNN through the gorge, and as I'll explain, east through the, into the Blue Mountains and the NP across Montana. Incredible. Uh, meanwhile, the UP was pushing west uh, using its Oregon Short Line Railroad subsidiary. Uh, they were coming west from Pocatello, and they had a goal of reaching Portland as soon as possible. And again, Villard said, well, if they build to Portland, nobody will want my railroad. So he decided he needed to build east to meet the OSL and prevent the UP from becoming a competitor. Uh, so construction east from Umatilla uh, on the Columbia, you could bring supplies by steamboat up the Columbia. Uh, following the Umatilla River began in February 81. They reached Pendleton in September 82. Um, Ballard negotiated hard with the UP management and he got a good deal that the meeting point would be at Huntington, Oregon, close to the Oregon-Idaho border. Uh, and uh, But the construction of the ORN through the Columbia Gorge west of the Dells was difficult, it was expensive, and it was poorly engineered. Um, you know, unlike uh, the Durant brothers building the UP or the Big Four building the Central Pacific or Jim Hill, uh, they had very good engineering talent working for them, and Villard didn't have anywhere near that good engineering. Uh, so their lines were not built uh, as well as the others. And the first train from Wallula to Portland finally arrived in November 82. Uh, and, you know, construction of the NP through Montana and the ONC down through the Siskios was also very difficult and expensive. Uh, you know, this guy is trying to do the impossible, build all these railroads at once. Uh, on September 83, a gold spike was driven in Montana and the NP was complete from Duluth 
to appropriately named Villard Junction, just near Wallula, uh, and from Portland to Tacoma. The NP had built down from Tacoma to Kalama, and Villard built up the Oregon side from Portland uh, almost to Goble, and then had a fer train ferry to go across to Kalama. And then by means of using the ORNN between Wallula and Portland, uh, the NP had fulfilled its charter of a railroad from the Great Lakes uh, to the Puget Sound and became the first Northern Tier Transcom. And then meanwhile, on the ORNN, they reached uh, Meacham in October 1883, almost at the summit of the Blue Mountains, where construction halted for the winter. And down on the ONC, they got to Grants Pass in December 83. Uh, but the construction through difficult terrain of so many lines all at once was just too much. The debt load of Villard's holding company soared, and Wall Street bears drove down the NP stock break price in late 83, and Villard lost control of the NP, the OC, and the ORNN. Uh, he suffered a nervous breakdown, and early in 84, he returned to Germany to recuperate. Uh, so in the wake of uh, Villard's departure, uh, the big four picked up the ONC, and that became the SP's line to Portland. Uh, and the new management of the NP decided they didn't want to use the ORNN. Uh, they wanted to build their own railroad over the Cascades to Tacoma. Uh, and the bondholders of the ORNN, since the NP doesn't want them and they lost everything else, they decided that they're, they, they, they need to sell their distressed company and hopefully to either NP or UP. Uh, but they have kind of this unfinished piece and they decided you know, since NP wants to build a Tacoma, UP is a better prospect. And to improve their bargaining position, they decided they'll fork over the additional money necessary to complete the line in Huntington as quickly as possible. So the first train arrived in Legrand in July 1884. Uh, and then with no fanfare, the last spike of the ORNN was driven in Huntington on November 25th, 1884. And through service with the OSL commenced on December 1st. So at this point, the UP ends in Huntington, and they connect with the ORNN to get to Portland. Uh, and uh, the bondholders got a huge relief when, in April 87, uh, they got an agreement with UP for the OSL to lease the ORNN. So at least they're off the hook now, and they got a cash flow. Uh, and then in September 89, um, the UP directed the OSL to purchase Villard's 50% block of ORNN stock for $12 million, must have been a huge sum in the day. And that at that point, UP now became the owner of a line to Portland. However, this large outlay helped propel the UP into bankruptcy in 1893. So the bankrupt UP defaulted on the ORNN bond and interest payments. And so the ORNN bondholders, again, German and East Coast guys, took the UP to court and they said, these guys don't pay, so we want the ORNN to be placed in receivership and become independent again. And the court approved this step, effective July 3rd, 1894. So once again, the UP has no railroad to Portland, and it's an independent company, and it was uh, renamed the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company. Uh, and now this is kind of an or orphan. It's not one of the big systems, and what's going to happen to it? So Jim Hill made the suggestion, well, we shouldn't have overbuilding in the Pacific Northwest. So how about if the OR and RNN is jointly controlled by NPGN and UP? Uh, but then we have another guy stepping into the picture, this guy, E.H. Herman, uh, who uh, had bought control of the UP, and it was a bargain basement prices after the bankruptcy. Uh, and he would have none of Hill's proposal. He noted that NP and GN had their own lines to the Pacific Coast, and UP ought to have their own line, too. So uh, early in 1900, UP made an offer to the ORNN shareholders to exchange their preferred or common stock for corresponding stock in UP. Uh, and practically all the stock in the company was exchanged by the end of the year, and now UP was in control for good. So Harriman invested heavily in the ORRNN, rebuilding the poorly engineered portions and making other upgrades. 
Uh, he died in 1909, but his lieutenants continued to carry out his plans. Uh, in 1910, they reorganized all their Oregon and Washington Railroad properties as the Oregon-Washington Railroad and Navigation Company, a fully owned subsidiary of the Oregon Short Line, in turn a subsidiary of UP. Uh, and although they had been reduced to paper entities decades earlier, um, OWR and N and OSL were not formally merged into UP until 1987. Um, and I'll mention that, you know, is uh, this origins as an independent railroad separate from the UP or slowly disappear over the years, but the mileposts still start 0, 0.0 at Portland and 389.3 at, at Huntington, where there's an equation uh, with uh, uh, 538 something on the Oregon short line. So it's one of the few places on the UP system where the mileposts go west to east. Okay, so let's go to the blues. Uh, that was, of course, a, a barrier for the Oregon Trail wagon trains, and then it uh, was a barrier for building a railroad from what, to get to Western Oregon from Idaho. Uh, the UP and the OR and N had done competing surveys through the mountains, both roughly following the Oregon Trail. Uh, the OR and N surveyors followed the water courses wherever possible. Uh, so the route is largely one through river or creek valleys and canyons. There were only four short tunnels required, two of which were subsequently daylighted. Uh, but the grades are pretty steep. So I put together a profile, an elevation profile here. You have the mileposts on the bottom, Hinkle at 183 and Huntington at 389, and then you have the elevation. Uh, and you can see we've got uh, three mountain summits to get over. Uh, so we follow the Umatilla River from Hinkle uh, through Pendleton uh, to Gibbon. We turn away from the river and follow uh, Meacham Creek up to the summit at Camilla. And then we go down Metanic and Pelican Canyons to Hillgard. Remember, Hillgard was the given surname of Henry Villard. Uh, and then we pick up the Grand Ronde River in the Grand and through the Grand Ronde Valley to Union Junction, where we climb out of the valley up Piles Canyon to Telecasset. Uh, then we go down to North Powder and pick up the Powder River Valley over to Baker. And we climb out of that valley up to Encina Summit and then go down steep grade, the railroad is called Hindman Hill. Uh, and then when we get down to Durkee, we pick up the Burnt River and follow that down to Huntington. And I'll take away the river names and put in the siding names. Uh, this is a pretty busy thing, so I won't try to go through all of this. Uh, but just to summarize, uh, the tough grades facing uh, the eastbound trains, which were the county trains back in the day, uh, it's pretty easy going along the Umatilla River. At Pendleton, it starts to be 1%, but you don't exceed 1% until you get along Meach Meacham Creek at Bonifer, and then it's 9 miles or 1.2 to Duncan, then it stiffens to 1.37 to 1.5 for the next nine miles to Huron. Then you have 13.3 miles of 2%, except for it eases a bit going through Meacham Meadows. And uh, it's downhill and uh, relatively level to Union Junction. Then we have 9.3 miles of 1.5% to Telecasset. Then it's down again and across the Powder Valley. And then we start climbing at Baker, but it's not really a grade until Quartz, and then it's four and a half miles of 1.5% up to Encina, and then downhill. Coming westbound, uh, it's not too bad coming out of Huntington along the Burnt River up to Durkee, uh, but then when you start out of Pritchard Creek, uh, you have 11.6 miles of 2.2% to Pleasant Valley, then it eases to 1.4 to the summit and Encina. Uh, then you don't have anything more than 1% all the way to Hillgard, and then you have another 11.4 miles of 2.21 to the summit at Camila. And at 2.21, that was the steepest mainline grade, grade on the traditional UP system. Uh, Harriman era improvements. Uh, ABS was in first thing to go in. That was installed uh, Huntington to Pendleton in 1906 with the classic Harriman semaphores and then the rest of the way Umatilla the next year. 
Uh, and then in 1916, uh, the 22-mile Coyote cutoff was completed from Messner, that's almost a Boardman west of Umatilla, uh, to the new station of Hinkle, and that shortened the line by nine miles, as well as easing the grades and curvature. Uh, and that prompted relocation of the crew terminal and yard from Umatilla uh, to Reith, which is four miles west of Pendleton. Uh, the railroad between Hinkle and Pendleton was originally built in the floodplain of the Umatilla River, so it was subject to flooding every year. Uh, and so Harriman said, you got to move this railroad up on the hillside out of the floodplain. So that was done in stages. Uh, Echo to Nolan was the worst part, so that was done first in 1902, uh, then Nolan to Pendleton in 1911, and, and then Hinkle to Echo in 1914. Uh, and then uh, up in the mountain, uh, where you had uh, trains stopped to set retainers and cutting out helpers and a lot of congestion, uh, they put in uh, some improvements just before USRA took over during World War I. They finished it uh, where Ross to Camila and yeah, on the other little ways down the other side of Nordine had a second main track uh, and a big center siding at Camila so trains could stand clear of the mains while they were turning up retainers. Uh, then uh, things were kind of uh, uh, static uh, through the 20s and 30s uh, until the World War II era when the traffic was really increasing. Um, uh, in 1951, you have the construction of McNary Dam on the Columbia River. So the sixth subdivision coming down from Spokane was going to go underwater from Wallula to Umatilla. So that portion of the line was relocated and it now had a new junction joining the main line at Hinkle. Uh, and so Hinkle UP piggybacked on that project and constructed Hinkle Yard. Uh, and so remember we went from Umatilla to Reith. Now we go from Reith back to Hinkle as the crew terminal and classification yard and Reith Yard was abandoned. Uh, then with the heavy traffic during World War II, uh, the railroad invested in CTC First stretch was La Grande to Pendleton, completed in 1944. Uh, then after the war in 47, they opened La Grande to Huntington. Uh, and the last stretch, Pendleton to Hinkle, was uh, uh, opened in 1952. Initially, the CTC dispatchers uh, were in La Grande. Uh, and then in the mid-1960s, they were moved to Albina Yard in Portland. Uh, and that's uh, where I caught up with it when I started working for UP. Uh, and here we have the Wabco CTC machines that control the mountain. The first subdivision is on the bottom here, and the second subdivision is right on top of it. Uh, and so one dispatcher could dispatch both subdivisions if it wasn't too busy. Um, we have the stretch from uh, Huntington to Quartz here, and we have the stretch uh, from Bonifer to Motanic here. Uh, Jim Gannett was the mountain dispatcher on the uh, Labor Day, 1972. He's got an empty railroad down here on this, on the first subdivision, boy. But you look at the lights lit up here on the second, and he's got a dozen trains there crammed in between Bonifer and Motanic. Uh, in the steam era, uh, motive power was Challengers and Bull Moose 2880s on the freight trains. Uh, Challengers, Northerns, and Mountains on the passenger trains. Uh, helpers were utilized on the grades to all three of the summits. Uh, mainline steam ended in December 55. Uh, and in the early diesel era, they still continued with helpers. Um, eastbound, it was most common to entrain them at Gibbon. Uh, they continue through Legrand, changing crews on both the head end and the helpers. Uh, and stay with the train all the way to Encina. Uh, and sometimes help break them down the hill further east on heavy trains. Uh, westbound, it would be typical to end train at Durkee or maybe further east down the Burnt River Canyon. Uh, and then stay in the train through Lagrange, change crews on the helper and the head end. And then at least go to Camila and sometimes uh, further west. Uh, the UP was essentially, traditional UP was essentially three separate railroads. The Northwestern District, the Eastern District, and the South Central District all had their own general managers. They made their own rules. In the case of the Northwestern District, we had a separate rule book from the rest of the railroad. 
Um, and the Northwestern District was very conservative about handling trains on mountains. Um, we had a 40 mile an hour maximum speed for any train exceeding 75 tons of car. Uh, and uh, retainers and heavy holding position were required on every car, 20 mile per hour max, uh, if you're going down a grade of 2% or more. Uh, and if your trains were 100 tons per car or more, uh, then you also needed to set retainers uh, on 1.5% grades. And other parts of the UP have had bad runaways and so forth, but the Oregon Division has never had a, a disaster like that, and I think it reflects their conservative safety rules. At um, any rate, the mileage claims from the helper crews, changing crews, and a 100-mile shove westbound or 130-mile shove eastbound, uh, and then the reverse light engine moves were really expensive. Uh, in 1970, Mark Sweet became the train master at LeGrand, uh, and he looked at the bills from this and thought about it and made some calculations. And he said, you know, uh, even running smaller trains all the way to North Platte, I think we'd be better off if we got rid of these manned helpers. Uh, so he wrote up a proposal to limit the eastbound trains to 4,500 tons and the westbound 4,000 tons and submitted it. Uh, Bill Fox was the VPO. He came out. That flew out to Pendleton, Mark picked him up and they drove him around the mountain and they watched him going on. And he said, Mark, you're right. Uh, and they approved the management. And so in 1970, manned helpers were eliminated in the Blue Mountains. Um, the UP had invested in local troll uh, on uh, uh, about uh, 16 uh, uh, master and slaves each, uh, SD-45s plus uh, a pair of DD-35s. Uh, they tried it first on the on the Overland route, Ogden to North Platte, and it didn't work very well. So they banished it to the Oregon Division in I, the Northwestern District. Uh, and uh, uh, it was implemented over the Blues beginning in 1971, uh, but they had trouble with it there. It was just in that early, crude electronics and that stuff was very hard to maintain radio continuity. Uh, and when you lost continuity, the slaves would keep doing whatever they were doing, whether you wanted them to do it or not. Uh, and so there were lots of problems with knuckles and drawbars. And so they limited the application to only one train in each direction per day during the 70s and 80s. Uh, in 1973, the crew terminal at Huntington was abolished. Uh, and a new 182-mile crew district, La Grande and Napa, over two mountain summits, was established uh, with mountain time prevailing throughout. Uh, and then, prompted by the rising diesel prices in the wake of the Arab oil embargoes, uh, manned helpers were reinstated in 1976. And also, I think, you know, local troll had not lived up to its billing. It was not really successful. You know, and it's kind of, you know, the electronics improved so much, now we take DPU for granted as, you know, it's it's really the same technology as local troll, right from the Harris Corporation patents. It's just been rebranded. So, you know, it wouldn't have the, the, the you know, the, the bad reputation following it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the improvements uh, that have been made to the railroad uh, through the 70s and beyond is, uh, uh, things were relatively stable uh, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, but in the late 70s, uh, as uh, Milwaukee started to falter in the Pacific Northwest, the traffic started to really grow in the UP. People tend to think of, oh, it was the BN that brought the Milwaukee down. But actually, if you look at what happened, most of the traffic Milwaukee lost went to the UP, not, not to the BN. Uh, and so the UP needed more capacity over the Blue Mountains. It was basically a CTC railroad with 5,000 foot sidings. Uh, with manned helpers coming back, they wanted to run bigger trains. Uh, and uh, uh, they also you know, needed more capacity. So the first step in this uh, 1977 was second miles of seven miles of second main track from West LeGrand to Lone Tree. Tra trains would stack up changing crews at LeGrand. Uh, so this gave them a place to stand without blocking traffic going the other way. Uh, and then that same year, 10 sidings were lengthened uh, from on the order of 5,000 feet to 8,200 feet or longer. Uh, so now you could run uh, uh, you know, long, bigger trains. 
Uh, then in 1978, they finished up three more sightings they didn't have time to do in 77. Uh, and then in 79, still spending money. Uh, well, I, I forgot one more thing. Is in 78, the Hinkle Hump opens. Um, that was not really driven by the Milwaukee Road traffic as much as it was just to try to eliminate switch engine shifts on the coast. Uh, uh, and then uh, you also have uh, a couple of projects to take out slow curves. Uh, the Minthorn 25 mile an hour curves were, uh, with a lot of uh, earth moving, were replaced by 60 mile an hour curves. Uh, and there were some 35 mile an hour curves coming out of Baker towards course that they re-engineered to be 50 mile an hour curves. So the eastbounds could get a run at that 1.5% grade. And then in 1979, the second main track was extended from Ross down to absorb Meacham siding. So we have a little more capacity uh, on the tough 2% grade. Uh, then you have uh, the, uh, the, the recession coming in, but uh, there was congestion associated with Hinkle Yard. So they built some second main track going west and then east in our territory over to Stanfield. So it's a little easier to get trains in and out without blocking other trains. Uh, and then you have the 81, 82 recession and 83, so no spending. Uh, but by the late 80s, uh, money is going back into the railroad. Uh, and you start extending the second main track out of the Grand the other way up to Perry. Uh, and then another siding gets lengthened at Union Junction. Uh, and then uh, in the 90s, you have uh, a second main track going in between Pleasant Valley and Encina. Uh, and then between uh, Tallacasset and Sago. Uh, and then uh, in 93, uh, the second main track gets extended down through Drawbar Alley from Meacham uh, to High Bridge. <coughs> Uh, and then uh, finally, court siding gets lengthened the same year. Uh, and then the last, uh, well, not quite last, it wasn't practical to extend Gibbon or Homley, so they built a new 8,200-foot uh, siding in between they named Milam. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, big improvement was uh, uh, around uh, the Leonard Horseshoe above Pritchard Creek and up the 2-2 to Oxman. Uh, putting in a second main track. Uh, so, and, and and things have been relatively stable since that time, although I think with PSR coming in and the desire to run even bigger trains, uh, we may see some more money going into the Blue Mountains. But basically from 1977 to 94, the railroad had been transformed uh, from uh, CTC 5,000 foot sightings to CTC at least 8,200 foot sightings and a lot of second main track on, on the steep grades. Okay, but my photos uh, tour of the line is gonna be back in the 1970s when it was uh, more short and fast. Uh, and so let me give you the lineup from those days. Uh, eastbound, the hot trains, uh, SPX was the traditional symbol for priority manifest out of Seattle and Portland. Uh, X is in UP lingo was an eastbound manifest train. Uh, the perishable schedules were protected by the Hinkle Fruit Train. Uh, and then in Tell 73, there was another section that originated in Portland called the HFD, the Hinkle Fruit Dow section. They resymboled it as the Advance SPX in 1973. Uh, then uh, th these were trains to North Platte Hump. Uh, then there were trains to the Pocatello Hump, the PLA trains. Uh, and by the uh, uh, Mid-70s, uh, the traffic had grown well enough that there were three sections at, on most days, one originating in Seattle, it's number 692, one at Portland, uh, and then one at Hinkle. And for whatever reason, uh, both the Seattle and Portland trains would have the same symbol, PLA, but the Hinkle train would be PLAH. Uh, and then beginning in 76, as Milwaukee lost uh, the TOFC and auto business, uh, the the ART symbol was added for another hot train out of Seattle. Uh, then uh, for the manifest, the tonnage trains going eastbound, uh, the WXH was the WX was a traditional 
symbol on the Northwestern District for a Washington manifest. Uh, and WXH was the section that originated in Hinkle. Uh, and that was a big tonnage train, usually local troll. He would have uh, uh, the lead and zinc from uh, Wallace and or from Kellogg, and he'd have uh, all the lumber uh, from the SI and Spokane. Uh, and after they uh, opened the Hinkle hump, they changed the symbol to the Hinkle lumber. Uh, NPX was the manifest out of Portland until 78. Uh, HPCX, uh, Hinkle Pocatello manifest was uh, the, the Pocatello hump train. Um, the chip rack special east uh, was uh, distributed the empty chip racks and other local traffic. Uh, and special grain train east, uh, uh, once the, as grain built up, you had a, a, a solid train of empty grain cars. Uh, the westbound, there were uh, a, quite a fleet of hot, uh, light tonnage uh, forwarder trains. The NWF, Northwest Forwarder, was the traditional symbol until 78. Uh, uh, in 72, they experimented by adding a, a second section they called the Northwest Overtake Forwarder. Uh, the Triple S, the South Seattle Special, had the uh, merchandise from the transloaders in Clearfield, Utah, including a lot of General Electric appliances. Uh, on the off delivery day, it was the LAS symbol. Then you had the advanced Northwest Forwarder that was resymboled as the Overland Mail North when they got the mail contract away from the Milwaukee in 76. Uh, the North Coast van uh, started in 74, and that was split in 75 into separate Seattle and Portland trains. Uh, and then you have the Portland super van. Uh, and then uh, as uh, UP picked up the auto business, you have the Portland Seattle autos, the PSA. So a lot of short and fast trains with a lot of horsepower. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, nowadays the manager would say, this is just way too expensive. You can't do this kind of thing. Uh, but in those days, uh, service was paramount, not cost. On uh, the Westbound Manifest, NWM would, was the traditional manifest. You'd have what a uh, few loads were not on the forwarder trains and it was mostly all the lumber and paper empties. Uh, the Pocatello Advanced Northwest Manifest uh, was the same kind of traffic off the Pocatello hump. Uh, they, uh, uh, if for trains that stayed within the Northwestern District, the Northwestern District got to make up the symbols. It wasn't dictated by Omaha. So they changed the symbol a lot of times. It became the CA, HMS, CA, where the telegraph calls for Pocatello, and then it became the POMX. NPH uh, was the carload train once the Hinkle hump opened. Uh, CRSW was the chip rack special west that I set up uh, uh, to the unit trains of wood chips. And uh, after the Hinkle hump op re opened, they resembled it as QH. Uh, Q was the telegraph call for Napa. Uh, and uh, starting in 78, they had enough traffic to run a, a grain train SGTW. Uh, then in addition to the road trains, uh, in this district, you have the Hinkle yard engines. Uh, to go to Umatilla on the old main line, uh, they would just uh, grab a unit off the power track and call a road crew to go out there. Uh, at Pendleton, there was a day switcher six days a week to service the Harris Pine Mill and, and the flour mill there. And then uh, during the night, another crew would make a turn out to Pilot Rock uh, to switch the Louisiana Pacific Mill. Uh, then at Legrand, there were, it was a yard engine job. He would uh, make a side trip out to the Boise Cascade Mill out the Joseph Branch at Bomb when, when needed. Uh, and then going out the Joseph Branch, you had uh, uh, the huge Boise Cascade Mill at El Elgin got a turn ser serving it six days a week. And there was a tri-weekly job that went all the way out to Joseph to get the lumber chips and grain from further out the branch. And the little short line, uh, the Union Railroad of Oregon uh, from Union to Union Junction would bring in a couple cars of lumber and a carload of wood chips five days a week. Uh, and the way they handled uh, the local traffic varied over the years, uh, but for the period I'm gonna talk about, uh, they had a tri-weekly local from La Grande to Baker, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and back Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday to get uh, uh, the lumber from Ellington Lumber and Baker and uh, the wood chips from there and the cement uh, from the wing uh, cement plant. And then there was one more local at Huntington, which would run up to Durkee and get the rock from Nelson. 
Okay, so uh, enough uh, of all the text and history. Now let me take you on a photo tour of the main line. We'll go east to west uh, from Hinkle to Huntington. Uh, so here we have a uh, steam special pulling by the Hinkle Depot, and it's attracted quite a crowd of managers and workers and the local public. Uh, over on the right there, you see all these uh, Santa Fe and BN cars. This is a detouring BN train. There was something wrong on their side of the river. Uh, and then uh, we brought up the Hermiston uh, Fire Department here to put water on the locomotive. Uh, 78 was the year the Hinkle hump opened, and initially the hump engines were uh, SD24s, especially geared and with creep control. Probably the last assignment for those locomotives. Uh, this is old Hinkle now, 1972, and here we have uh, the hottest train on the railroad, the SPX, with two Centennials and a DD35. He's made a mainline crew change and uh, is charging out of town. You see the cab track and yard engines uh, on the east end of the yard. And you look back at their hottest train and it's mostly carload. And that little string of about 20 trailers, uh, that's all that, <laughs> all the eastbound intermodal off from Portland and Seattle that day. Uh, the intermodal revolution was very late to come to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and you know, the business stayed in boxcars much longer than the rest of the country. Okay, so we'll go along the Umatilla River uh, going east. Uh, this is uh, approaching Hinkle. There's the Stanfield. There's the beat dump down here. And we have the Northwest Forder in the morning uh, coming up uh, with the typical two Centennials and a third unit they added at Pocatello to get over the Blue Mountains. Uh, and uh, there's one cut of intermodal here for Portland and another cut back there for Seattle and the rest of its carload. Uh, now we're along the Umatilla. The original railroad was down here in the floodplain and got flooded out all the time. So Harriman had them put it up here on the shelf out of harm's way. And so here we are coming up to the Barnhart Tunnel. This, there's our cut of Portland intermodal and there's the cut of Seattle intermodal and uh, lumber and paper and perishable interspersed. Four SC40s on the train this day. The mountain crews much preferred SD40s to the big uh, Centennials and uh, and other units, uh, you know, on the 2-2 grades, it was really nice to have all those traction motors and rather than hot rods. Uh, this is the other side of the Barnhart Tunnel and a westbound, the Triple S. Uh, and this beautiful boxcar block here, this is all the Clearfield merchandise, uh, a lot of GE appliances. Uh, the other uh, appliance makers like Whirlpool and so forth. The UP basically had a, a lock on all of the appliance business to the West Coast with their transit rates and the transloading facilities in Utah. There was no inventory tax in Utah. So the appliance makers could store their inventory there and just replenish the stores, the retailers uh, from Utah rather than from all the way back in, in uh, Kentucky or Pennsylvania or wherever. And again, you can see how the railroad is way up on an embankment out of the floodplain. Here they cross from one side to the other, and where they did that, they made sure the railroad was up high so it wouldn't get flooded out. Uh, now we have a meet at Reith. Here's uh, the Seattle section of the NCV uh, hot train with uh, three Centennials. Again, not that much intermodal here. There's a lot of autos there going to Kent and Tigard. Uh, and where are these farm buildings here? This was once the Reith Yard, uh, which was abandoned in uh, 1951 when they moved to Hinkle. Going down the siding here is uh, an HPCX, and you can just see the exhaust from the local troll units there, and he's going out the siding at the other end. The NCVS was waiting on the main for him to head in. Uh, so I imagine uh, the chief got an earful about that. Uh, now we're we're at the Minthorn Curves in 1975. Uh, this local troll, Hinkle Pocatello, is slowed down to 25 miles an hour for these sharp curves uh, along the bank. Uh, it's nice the railroad was up on the bank. It kept him out of the floodplain, but then it became slow track here. 
So then we jumped to 1979 and the track used to go off over here in the bank on the slow curves. And now with a massive amount of earth moving, we have a high track above the floodplain and the steam train can go chugging through at 60 miles an hour. Okay, so we'll go up out of the Umatilla River and up Meacham Canyon. Uh, as you get up to where the canyon gets narrow and it gets steep, uh, and there's a lot of very sharp curves, uh, was affectionately known on the railroad as Drawbar Alley for obvious reasons. Uh, so here we have uh, the SPX, that same train you saw at Hinkle with the two Centennials and the DD35 uh, uh, grinding up the 2% grade. Uh, and now we'll look down on the same place from up above. We were looking at the train coming through these curves. Now I'm on the other side of the canyon at the top, and we're looking down on an empty soda ash train coming up the 2% grade. Uh, and then a little later in the day, we have the Seattle Z. Uh, and now we're no more boxcars. It's a solid intermodal train. Uh, here's some of the sharp curves in Drawbar Alley as the Chip Rack Special East comes up with the, the local troll power going back. You don't need local troll on the train of empty, so the local troll units are just on the front here. They're not operating as local troll. And then you can see in Pendleton, he's picked up the Harris Pine and the Louisiana Pacific lumber loads. And behind that are all the empty chip racks. Uh, and even though this is an eastbound train, at the end of the day, the tracks turn around so much in Meacham Canyon that you're heading right into the sunset. And now we'll go up past Meacham uh, onto the, the two main track. Uh, this is near Ross, it's just behind me, was the end of two main tracks back in 1974. And here's a Pocatello Hinkle drag coming down uh, the 2% with a couple of DD35s and an SD40. Uh, and then here we have the SPX. The hot train is being routed into the center siding at Camila. Uh, this is at the, the west switch of Camila. Uh, and the reason he was routed into the siding is here comes uh, the Pioneer, westbound Pioneer on Amtrak Pioneer. The summit is uh, right here where you transition from 221 going this way to 2% down the other way. They got an 8,000 uh, series kicker in there too. Yeah, this was in, you know, after 76, it's the, the Big Mac era where the standard lash up was two centennials and, a, and an 8,000. Um, now, uh, this is the center siding at Camila. We're, this is a, a steam train coming eastbound, approaching the summit. These are some of the section homes. Uh, in the winter, it's not so easy to get in and out of there, so the UP provided uh, homes. You can see the section form has got his whole family out there to watch the, the steam train go by, and a couple of his men are over on the other side to roll the train. Uh, and then the train's working hard. He's still going up to 2%, but he's going to have to transition as he goes around this corner. Uh, and then you see him shutting off uh, as he carefully take the train over the summit. This is not exactly a dynamic brakes train. So you can... <laughs> uh, here's a view of uh, eastbound coming there. You can just see the headlight as he's coming up to the top of the 2%, and you got to trans transition into the 221. So here he is grinding up to the top of the grade and over the top. And a typical dog's breakfast on the chip rack, Special East. And one of the local troll units, a DD-35, an SD-40, a Jeep-20, a Jeep-9. And then coming the other way up the 221, uh, here's a, a drag that had got a drawbar. The first half of his train he left here. Now, obviously, they better have set a lot of handbrakes on that grade, and he's bringing the second half of his train up the center siding, and then he'll put them together. Uh, and that's quite a spectacular show with that, you know, transition from 2 to one up to 2% down. So here we have uh, the heavy North Platte Hinkle grinding up uh, the grade. Um, this normal position uh, for the center siding power switches was like this to provide derail protection. So you had a couple of switch motors 
uh, at the end. Here we have uh, the NWM drag coming up uh, uh, um, into, uh, and then uh, just down a little ways is Nordine, the end of two main tracks. And here we have the SPX waiting to go down. The head brakeman is standing out here uh, and the NWA advanced Northwest forward are coming up. I always got mad at my fellow dispatchers for running the railroad right-handed here because you come around this eight degree curve into a number 14 turnout and the trains would typically go into massive wheel slip. And I always say, why the hell don't we run a left-handed railroad there? Uh, but uh, uh, no, nobody listened to me. At any rate, uh, you notice the middle DD35, there's no exhaust coming out, but there's enough power with the other two to, to make the hill. They finally listened to you in later years. When Good. Most westbounds glad to hear it. Stay well, on Main Two. That was just like my experience in the headquarters. You know, after they forget who suggested it, they will implement it. <laughs> Any rate, uh, uh, you don't get a lot of snow in the blues, but you do get enough to run a snow service of sorts to where you push a Jordan spreader and have a snow blower. So I uh, hear they're working away in February '74. Uh, to get the tracks clear so uh, the triple S can come through unimpeded. And here's the steam train at the same place. Okay, we'll go down from Nordine down uh, Motanic Canyon down the 221 grade. Uh, here's uh, the Northwest overtake forwarder coming up the grade approaching Nordine, two Centennials and an SD40. Uh, the overtake forwarder was uh, the I idea to try to, the, the Iowa lines were all in terrible decline. Their track was getting slow ordered. They were getting later and later coming to the UP and getting too late to make a, a third morning spot on the West Coast out of Chicago. So the UP got the idea with the late connections, well, we'll run some powered up over forwarders to try to catch up and make it, which they called the overtake forwarders. Uh, but the schedules were already tight, and they really couldn't make any better time than the regular forders. So after a year, they gave up. Uh, this uh, kind of illustrates what the Blue Mountains were like in the 1960s, as you have seven Jeep 9s, a mixture of A and Bs, taking a drag up the grade. Uh, now we're down at uh, Motanic Siding, and we have the SPX going downhill, uh, that same train we saw at the Barnhart Tunnel with the four SD40s, and he's got the paper loads on the point. And then coming up the siding is the Northwest Overtake Forwarder, and we have a rolling meet on the 221 grade. And there's the big cut of uh, the Portland Intermodal. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, some perishable. This is probably uh, cherries uh, out of the Dalles, maybe. Uh, pears out of Wood River. Uh, the cherries were a disaster. Uh, they're just too fragile for rail transport. Um, the claims exceeded the revenues, <laughs> let alone the cost. Mm -hmm. So they tried, after failure in the cars, they tried them in the trailers. It didn't work, and they finally just had to give up on the traffic. Uh, but, you know, not going very fast, but neither train stopped, which is uh, really nice on the mountain. Uh, and then uh, that same place uh, in the summer, here's uh, that NWM drag coming up with three DD35s. And, and almost the exact same place in the winter, here's the advanced Northwest Forwarder with the same kind of lash up. Uh, this is coming down in a light rain at uh, Motanic Siding, basically the other way with the SPX was just empty auto racks and intermodal by uh, the late 70s, no car load. Uh, and then uh, here's the ART train. He's picked up uh, the ingots at uh, Longview and <coughs> uh, some other stuff before you get back to the intermodal and autos. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then uh, in the Motanic Canyon, below Motanic Siding, you can see the freeway overpass down there. Here's a, a manifest coming upgrade with brand new U30Cs. 
Uh, and then uh, further down uh, from the freeway, you transition from Otanic to Pelican Canyon. Uh, down in this stretch, uh, this was that train that got a drawbar. And if you look carefully, you'll see a couple of crewmen on top of that boxcar. That was where they got the drawbar. So the rest of the train is tied down on the grade. And they're taking the first half up to Camila, and then they'll come back to get the second half. And you can see from a dead start on that 221 grade, they're sanding the rails like crazy and throttle and want run eight to get up the grade. Uh, this is coming down Pelican Canyon, uh, the ace packs uh, with the perishable and intermodal, some British Columbia lumber in there too, off the barge in Seattle. Uh, and then coming uphill in the canyon, here's uh, the NOF uh, to the two centennials that came out of North Platte. They added an SD40 at Pocatello in deference to the grade. Uh, and then here's the steam train coming down at the same place. Uh, and then uh, the next day, the steam train coming back up at the same place. Uh, once we get to Hillgard, we pick up the Grand Ronde River. Uh, this is coming down to the west switch at Hillgard. So we're just coming off the 221 grade. Uh, and this NPX manifest this day had a couple of SP units working off mileage behind the DD35. Uh, you see there's a whole bunch of BN cars there. This was uh, during a, a strike, uh, UTU selective strikes. Uh, they hit took the BN out in August. And so these are loads off the Bend branch that have been diverted to the UP. Uh, and this is at Hillguard siding down along the freeway, and we have brand new U30Cs uh, bringing the HFD down and the NWF. Initially, they didn't trust them as much as the SD40s, so they ran them in five-unit lash-ups while they were happy to run four-unit lash-ups of the SD40s. And then here's uh, the Seattle section of the NCV with three centennials coming up to Hillgard. Uh, and here's the Chipwreck special uh, coming down along the Grand Run in the freeway. You can see all the empty Chipwrecks in train, and the, he's bringing uh, you know branch line power back to La Grande on a on a Sunday probably. Uh, and then here's uh, the HFD coming down and. Uh, uh, below between Perry and Legrand. This was double track, so they had to do a lot of earth moving to create a big enough shelf for a second track. Uh, and then here we are coming into Legrand Yard, um, the steam train coasting in. Uh, for a while in the 70s, <laughs> the Carmen had these little Subaru <laughs> rigs. You see him taking <laughs> the flag off. Uh, they didn't stand up to the weather in Legrand very well. They didn't last very long. We still have uh, the watering uh, facilities for the passenger trains and it's still here in 72. Okay, so we'll go across uh, the Grand Ronde Valley from Legrand over to Union Junction. Uh, nice valley vistas there with the Wallowa Mountains in the distance. Here's uh, the ABB DD35s on uh, the NWM, that SP car is probably a load, but the, <laughs> behind that is all lumber and paper empties. Uh, now we're getting over towards Union Junction. This is the Triple S coming west. Uh, and back there is Union Junction siding. And then if you look carefully, you'll see a train going up the grade that he met at Union Junction is now climbing up the 1.5% into Piles Canyon. So we'll head up Piles Canyon. And here we have uh, the SBX climbing out of the Grand Ronde Valley with the Big Mac lash up and the all intermodal train, very typical late 70s scene. Uh, and there's a horseshoe curve uh, just uh, beyond there. That's the town of Union in the Grand Ronde Valley. Uh, and then here we are coming around the curve. This is again during the BN strike. So there's Again, a lot of BN loads uh, diverted onto the UP. Hey, Rob, before you go to the next one, what is that? What are those two cars kind of mid train there? These are open top lumber loads. Okay, thank you. There's a wrapped 
open top there. Here's another wrapped. There's also some rare Burlington lettered green box cars uh, right there in the top yep. middle. Okay, here's one here and a couple here, one yep. there, one there. Yeah, quite a few in that train. Yeah. Yeah, it might be worth pointing out that this was pre-drone. So you were up there on foot to these locations, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, all, the, all these uh, pictures were, were, were great hikes. Now I'm standing on the mountain on the other side of the canyon, and we're looking across. This is coming around that horseshoe, so we were up on this hill in the previous picture. Uh, and here's the ace packs uh, working up the grade. Uh, you could see uh, the, you know, there's a barge that came in from Canada there, so he's got a lot of heavy lumber, but there's some perishable and, and intermodal here. They had a great wreck there in 1985. Yeah, I imagine. And then... Uh, an hour and a half behind, you have uh, the SPX running with uh, three centennials. And then as we look the other way, uh, uh, there's the west switch of uh, Crooks. Uh, come on, cursor there. And uh, we've uh, double caboose the Denver UPS, uh, which will cut off at Cheyenne for a quick move. Uh, and in the siding at Crooks is the NCVS also running with three centennials. And you look at, you know, here's the intermodal and the car load and then some junk fill. I oh, picked up a little sugar there at the nap. Uh, but, you know, these very short trains with tremendous horsepower, this was the short and fast UP in the 1970s. Uh, now we're coming up to Tallacasset to the top of the 1.5 grade uh, uh, the general manager's business car is uh, behind the Big Mac Power, a few empty auto racks, a couple perishable, and then all the intermodal. And then looking the other way off the overpass, uh, here's the OMN cresting the top of the grade from 1% to 1.5% down with all the, uh, the UPS and mail loads. And then we'll go down from Telecasset uh, to North Powder. Uh, 1% uh, grade uh, and relatively short. Uh, you come down from Telecasset and uh, past, uh, this is, there was a short CTC siding just a little ways down from Telecasset called Sago. And it wasn't useful for freight trains, but it, when the Portland Rose trains were on time, that was where they normally met. They usually were on time. But then after the passenger trains ended, the UP ripped it out. But then uh, when they started the two main track program, now there was a second main track coming back down here from Telecasset. So they essentially put it back. Uh, and then we pick up the Powder River. Uh, you can see the Willowa Mountains in the distance and the tracks come along the river. And then this is where the river turns like this, but the railroad heads into a cut and heads up the grade to Telecasset. And we have three Centennials and an SD40 on the you know, here's the short, hot train that came out of North Platte, and then there's a short fill of lumber empties for Legrand, but that they've uh, they've cut off at Legrand. And then once we're down at North Powder, uh, we're the grades and curves are behind us, so they can uh, open the throttle for a fast run across the Powder Valley. And so uh, here, the, the Ace Packs is uh, accelerating. Uh, and then coming the other way is uh, the NCVS at the uh, across in the east switch of North Powder. And you see uh, the brake shoe smoke. He's in big hole here. He had a dynamiter and it got him on that curve. Uh, but they pumped off the air and everything seemed okay and they took off again. Uh, same place uh, with uh, some rain clouds in the mountains. You can see now it's 78, so the helpers are back. So these guys have made the light move from Legrand and they're going all the way to Durkee or further to pick up a westbound train. Meanwhile, the hot triple S with all the boxcar merchandise uh, and the high speed geared units is uh, charging down the main line. Uh, I we'll see in a moment, I photographed him at courts and then I had to just bust ass drive 75 miles an hour on the freeway and just barely beat him here. Okay, so we'll jump over to Baker. Uh, and uh, up the hill to Ensina. Here we are at Quartz, and you can see the break in grade where the 1.5% grade starts leaving uh, Quartz siding up to Ensina. In the winter, the blues are full of snow. Uh, we have uh, a nice block of perishable out of Hood River ahead of the Portland Intermodal. 
And then coming down at the east switch of uh, uh, Quartz is the Portland Supervan. Uh, this was, uh, the, you know, the last uh, train of the day out of Chicago. You could, or left Chicago early afternoon, and then they would try to make third morning uh, Dray pickup on the West Coast. So this would be, you know, a short train making an incredible fast run. Uh, you know, like 50 hours to the coast. So, and uh, so a Centennial and a Fast 40 on a little train. Uh, he's, you know, just coming off the curves and the slow track, and now he can open it up. And so uh, he's really kicking up the dust as this guy is off to the races. Uh, here's the Triple S coming down at the same place in the light rain. Uh, on a number of the DD45s and the DD35s and the and the SD45s had high speed gearing so they would be reserved for the hot trains uh, like this so they could make the fast run uh, here's the triple s on a different day with the centennials and an SD40 in the same place so it's dropping down the 1.5 grade uh, the freeway is up there there's a Monon trailer. I'm not quite sure how that made a move from LA to Portland without violating car service rules, but uh, there it is. And here's the Hinkle Fruit uh, coming up at the same place. This is in February, so there's not a lot of perishable, uh, maybe just some potatoes out of storage. Uh, interspersed with other lumber and other stuff, but they're running the service, running the schedule. Uh, and then the same train up at Insina Summit, uh, you can see the rem remnants of the Y for turning the steam engines. Uh, he's working some BN power, working off uh, horsepower hours you owed to the UP. Uh, then uh, from Insina and Pleasant, and we go down to Pleasant Valley and then down Hindman Hill. Uh, here we are at Pleasant Valley, and the two two grade ends right up there. And then there's a brief leveling, and then we go up the 1.4 to uh, Encina. And uh, this is the Portland Seattle autos. You can see the SD 40s, uh, fast 40s are sanding the rails hard uh, to take this huge train uh, up the grade. I know this is. M Milwaukee dominated the autos to uh, Spokane and Seattle, but uh, as they, their service declined, uh, uh, the stuff moved over uh, to the UP, the CNW and the UP, and that led to the creation of this train. Uh, now we're looking down on Hindman Hill, Pleasant Valley and the freeway are just behind us. The track comes twisting up the grade. Here we have one of my chip rack specials and there's the local troll power uh, shoving on uh, the huge train of chip racks grinding up the grade. Uh, and then uh, after the Hinkle Hump, uh, it's reassembled as the QH. Here it is at the same place uh, coming up the grade. You see the freeway down below. Uh, and then uh, mid train, he's got uh, three SD40 manned helper. Uh, and then uh, below Oxman siding, uh, here's the, the, the Chicago Seattle Z coming up the grade. This in 94 would become two main tracks. Uh, all the way down through here. Uh, same place, you can see the old Highway 30 overpass I was standing on for the previous photo and the Pioneer Limited dropping, or the Pioneer dropping down the grade. And uh, then we'll move down uh, to the area of uh, the Horseshoe Curve. Uh, here's uh, the SPX coming down with the general manager's business car and the Big Macs. Fortunately, the horseshoe was in the shadow, so I came back on a day that was all sunny to shoot it. And here we have all the intermodal out of Seattle and uh, the Big Mac sandwich rounding the curve. This is all two main tracks now. Uh, and you can look down and see the power going the other way as uh, stuff from the port of Tacoma goes by. Probably not, probably was port of Seattle in 78. FESCO is a Russian uh, container line, OOCL is Hong Kong. Uh, and here's an NWM drag coming the other way uh, up the grade in the, in the late afternoon, early evening. Uh, and we can look down and see uh, the mid-train helpers. Uh, 
And then a shot from the late 80s, 89, and uh, some newer power on uh, the North Platte, Seattle, coming around the curve. And by this time, they'd gone to a practice of uh, the helper shove on the rear rather than being cut in. Uh, now we're down. Uh, this uh, uh, Portland Supervan is just starting into the Horseshoe Curve. You can see the start of the 2-2 grade at the bridge at, over Pritchard Creek there, and Cherokee Town is back. So power is notched out and uh, to get up two two grade. And here's an empty soda ash coming off the two two, uh, in the other way. Uh, and then uh, from Durkee, we can go down the Burton River Canyon uh, to finish this off. Uh, the tracks are kind of level through Durkee, and then they drop off down into the canyon. So here's the the Chipwreck Special East uh, dropping down into the canyon, leaving Durkee. Uh, and then here's the SPX further down uh, along the Burnt River next to the freeway. Uh, this is uh, Monday morning, and so uh, Sunday night out of Seattle, there wouldn't be anything to haul. Uh, and then you'd cancel the a ASPX. So the Monday morning's train would have typically four Centennials and two SD40s, like you see here, and not much of a train. The caboose is right. All right, so I'll uh, end the show here with the uh, beautiful Le Grand Depot, uh, still extant there and still used by the railroad. Uh, and I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'll take a look in the chat to see what questions uh, might be there. Very nice, Rob. As good as I remembered at the Union Pacific Convention. Just a delightful presentation, folks. I hope everybody had a chance to enjoy that. That's While I've got everybody here, I'd like to actually put my friend the firebug on the line, George Foster. And George, could you talk a little bit about taking trains up Drawbar Alley for us? Yeah, Drawbar Alley was uh, eliminated before I got there in 86. So, but I did talk to people that always referenced it and said how often that they get a drawbar in those tight curves between the high bridge and Meacham. So at that time they had those tight curves and I, I don't remember if they had the, if they had daylighted those tunnels yet, but in really old photos, there were one or two tunnels between uh, Meacham and the high bridge. So they'd get a train that was like maybe only 3,600 tons, but pulling through those tight curves uh, and if the unit slipped, uh, they'd get a drawbar. So it was just what it said. But uh, when I got there, it was it was much improved. So you know we didn't have as much many problems and, and everything there. I didn't I didn't mention that when they put the second main track in there, they also did a fair amount of earth moving and eased the curves quite a bit. Yes, and they that did certainly helped. My my memory, uh, George is. I'd, I'd be riding trains. I, I rode freights whenever I could just to understand the railroad and what was happening. And, and you'd have these mixed consists of SD40-2s and SD45s. And the 45s had the high-speed gearing. They had 59-18 gearing, not 62-15. So right. they would make transition at different times than the other units, right? And when you're going about 20... 22 miles and they were constantly going in and out and every time they were going to transition we'd hold our breath for for fear we'd get a drawbar yeah because on the on the sd40-2 you could consistently especially if you're on level track you know you're kind of really getting going and so you'd uh you could consistently depend upon getting through transition at around 22 to 24 miles an hour and uh when you went to transition the ammeter dropped out and, and then it came on with a vengeance. No. And so uh, anyway, uh, each unit kind of, well, you know, obviously made its own transition. So you might make transition on your unit, but maybe the others hadn't made theirs yet or vice versa. Yeah. So, but with the SD 45s, I had some other issues with those because it never seemed like the, the uh, governors wanted to uh, govern the engine consistently. They, somebody must have thought that 
filling up the governor with the oil meant filling it to the top when it should have no. been halfway <laughs> in the sight glass so <laughs> that you know you wouldn't have that uh what we called hunting of the engine you would just you know each throttle notch you'd go up and it was real nice and clear and consistent whereas when you had the governor full then you'd go one notch at a time and it'd go like that so you just never knew wow. but i prefer the dash twos the way they rode also Great stuff. Anybody in the audience got a question either for George as an engineer who operated in the Blue Mountains or or for Dr. Leachman? A fantastic presentation, Rob. Um, I will say as a spoiler alert to those in the audience, Dr. Leachman and I are going to get together again for some future programming, folks. Rob's got a lot of really great material, and I can't wait to be able to share it with our audience. So that's going to be coming up in the not too distant future. Uh, we're getting towards the bottom of the hour, so I'm going to say, does anybody have anything more or anybody want to, Roy Gelder? Uh, Janine, I just had one, Go ahead. one question for Dr. Leachman. Did the opening of Hinkle have anything to do with the closure of Pocatello, Dr. Leachman? Not, no, is that it was, uh, it was a proposal from the operating department to try to, uh, you know, reduce locals and switch engine shifts. Uh, west of the Cascades, uh, and to concentrate, you know, all the detail blocking, even for industry zones at Hinkle. Uh, and they, you know, I I was in Omaha at the time when we did the cost studies on it and the simulations and stuff, and it was a real battle to try to justify it. And they never talked about any effect on the rest of the railroad, Pocatello or East. They were still going to continue to do that. It was just a proposal to try to you know, save money on the coast. And, uh, you know, I, I <laughs> they, they wanted to take my, I had put in the chip trains, which bypassed Hinkle and all the other yards to turn the chip cars faster. And they wanted my chip cars back in the Hinkle hump. They needed as many cars over the hump as they could possibly get to justify it. So I was an enemy of, of that project, but they went out and the, the Hinkle hump got built. And, you know, it was much, much later those humps coexisted for a very long time before, before P P Pocatello was uh, shut down. I think, didn't it, you know, even last into the nineties, I believe. And I think it was more a casualty of uh, the merger. Once you had the SP, you didn't need to run LA traffic via Pocatello. Uh, and so that took a huge, you know, was a huge amount of traffic off that yard. So that was really the death knell. All right. Very interesting. Thank you. So, so before I let everybody go and let let you guys get out and do your last minute Christmas shopping, I just kind of want to check around uh, the country and, and see what our weather conditions are. I'd like to start with my dear friend Dave Johnson in Mason City, Iowa. What's it like there today, Dave? Um, it's mostly cloudy, about thirty eight degrees. Uh, we're going to have a warm week coming up. Uh, no snow on the ground. Uh, I do have uh, one question for. Uh, uh, Dr. Leachman. Go ahead, and Dave. That would be, when you were in Omaha, did you know or work with Joe Reddy or Paul Phillips? Uh, I didn't work with either one. No, I didn't I didn't know them. Okay, so, they have some, site, some sort of an organization that special studies and stuff like that. Uh, I, I was there from 67 to 79, and uh, 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 I traveled, uh, I started out in the mechanical department, and uh, ended up a uh, couple years after the management trainee program uh, working uh, assistant to the general mechanical engineer. So all the all the units you're showing, all the area you had, I had to pass good on everything, and and I was over it a few times in the engine cabs. And this has been a most delightful presentation. It's it's like returning to home. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, Dave, the only guys I knew well in the mechanical department were Vince Macklin, who did the train performance calculator software. I, I worked with him a lot. Yeah, uh, I, I worked and, with Vince for a while. And he would, the projects you're talking about, he would give to me because he didn't know hardly anything about computers. And yeah. That, 
that whole episode eventually got me working for John Jorgensen at MIS, and and uh -huh. most of my time was uh, interface uh, MIS to the communications department because I could uh, the old wire chiefs, you know, the grizzly old wire chiefs. Uh, I was one of the few young kids wet behind the ears that could actually send American Morse. And yeah. I got along famously with those old guys. Yeah. I, my my first job on the UP was breaking in in the wire office in Albina. But we didn't use any Morse. It was all teletype. By the way, Dave has said, I have fond memories of uh, visiting you in the Iowa terminal shop. And I was so impressed with what you were doing with that little short line. Oh, yeah. I didn't recognize you. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that the yeah, Iowa traction, folks. So that's a real railroad. And Dave, I know we're we're gonna digress here a little bit, but I want you because I've got Roy Gelder on the line. Roy worked uh, for many of his years for the Belt Railway of Chicago. And Dave, just briefly, could you talk a little bit about your system that you developed at UP that could keep track of where every freight car was in the yard? Uh, yeah, that could be a program in itself. Um, I, well, let's think about that. The, 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 the project I was assigned was, uh, and, and, it, and it was, it got assigned just because of uh, uh, random discussions, but there was a gentleman that had worked for an engineering firm out in California, and the problem was, how do you identify where every car is in a flat switchyard? The hump yards, of course, had their computers and 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 all that. They knew where everything was. But so he told me the the engineering firm that he worked for, they worked on this project for two or three years and they could not come up with anything. They, they didn't know how to do it. Well, I couldn't hardly believe that. So I was into HO model railroading and I went home and and I made a HO for the HO track, a little detector that would uh, each detector would pr produce two outputs, either a zero or a one. And depending upon the when, when any one output changed, you had to create an interrupt and you had to save that state. And if you start thinking about a wheel moving across these detectors, it would take a you know, of, of two white lights, say, it would, there's a sequence would tell you whether it's going left to right or right to left. In addition, a little logic could tell whether the wheel moved onto the detector and then back off of it, not completing a complete movement. So I made this up that evening in my house, a little three foot track, and I took it into this MIS director that said it couldn't be done, set it on his desk, and he about wet his pants. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, the Union Pacific was paying for a, uh, uh, they were paying the tuition for a master's program. And so I was, I was in that. And for a thesis, what I did was I wrote my thesis on, uh, on computerizing a flat switchyard. And not only Honeywell do donated a, a 315 process control computer, and I built about a, oh, I don't know, a 16 foot yard with five or six tracks and switches on each end. And we actually demonstrated this thing. And so you, I assume you you knew, uh, uh, Dr. Leachman, you knew Fox, right? The, the yeah. general. Okay. So during this demonstration, Fox and a bunch of other officials was down there. And I demonstrated this thing and it had a CRT. And you could list the tracks and so on and so forth. And so when I got all done, why like, the officials were all talking with one another, this 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 fox was really quite a guy. He's he kind of sidles over to me and, and he says, Well, now this is all well and good, but he says, I I'll bet you I can I can I the switchman will get this all screwed up real quick. And so I said to him, I said, Well, I'll tell you what, I'll be the switchman and you be the yard master, and you tell me what moves you want me to make on this model, and then we'll see if we can screw it up. And he just relished this. He said, okay, take that caboose and that car and put it on this on five track and take these cars from four and move them over to two and do all this. And so we tore apart a train and we put the train back together again and we got all done. I said, now that's what you want? And he says, yeah. And uh, 
He says, uh, that certainly has got your computer screwed up. And I said, well, let's list the track and look. And I said, I turned to him and I said, do you want the listing east to west or west to east? <laughs> and he kind of looked at me. Uh -huh. and, and, well, let's go east to west, you know. So I keyed that in and, and brr, here's the list. And I said, well, there's the list. What do you think? So he goes right over to the scope and he looks at it and he looks at the model and he looks at the scope and he looks at the model and he does that four or five times and he says, well, I'll be goddamned because <laughs> <laughs> it was right. <laughs> what year was this, Dave? Oh, gosh, this had to been uh, mid-70s, maybe. Wow. How about that? Eric uh, Vandervoort, uh, Eric's got a question or just a thumbs up? Just a thumbs up. Okay, two thumbs up. Yeah, great story. Oh, I, I got a more story. I had, it, it, uh, Dr. Leachman, did you ever ever uh, hear about Tescar 210 or get on that? I, 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 I never got on it, no. Oh, I, I, can I knew of it, but I, you know, I wasn't really close to mechanical uh, department stuff. Well, they, they went out when they had all this, the local troll and all that stuff, they went out and hit the test car to these trains and everything. And uh, I never went out on an assignment except once. And that was when they were testing those GE uh, uh, U30s. And they were, I got a call, the guy, Al Williams was, uh, the man that was in charge of the test car and he had some medical problems. So uh, they gave me a two day notice, uh, be in North Platte on Sunday and you're gonna run to Hinkle and then you're gonna turn the, te they're gonna turn the test car and you're gonna run right back with a Hinkle fruit. And uh, um, I'd never been on that test car before, but uh, um, I did do for Vince Macklin, I did do an analysis of their stopping brake tests and one of them was I got to looking at it. You know, I, I would get the data and run the computer programs. And I got to looking at it and here you've got a 6,000 ton train moving 60 miles an hour that got stopped in a five eighths of a mile. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, does that sound right? Does anybody think that sounds right? No. So, no. so uh, no. uh, a guy named Bruner was one of the mechanical officers, a really nice guy. I felt like I could, I popped in his office and say, say, I got a question for you. How the hell can this train stop in a five eighths of a mile with all this tonnage and everything? And he got right on the phone and he chewed, he called direct to the car, he chewed him out and he says, here's what we found. You guys aren't doing your job. This is impossible. What they found, you know, what they found was one of the transducers on the wheel that produces pulses. We got, it got screwed up so it wasn't producing all, all the pulses. And so the distance, so the train got stopped and the distance was a mile and a quarter. However, the pulses only showed about five eighths of a mile. So uh, half I, the pulses were working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I got them, uh, I, I better shut up. Well, they, you know, we'll have you back as, a, I'll talk to you after yeah. the program. Yeah. We'll have you back as a guest sometime. How's that sound? Yeah, get Dave to do a show. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, let's uh, let let's get you know Dr. Leachman's got some last minute Christmas shopping to do, so let's uh, just go around the room quick. And uh, I want to check the weather. Roy in Geneva, Illinois. How is it there? Forty and clear. All right. And Joel McCurry in Cary, North Carolina. Joel, if you're there, give us an update on uh, North Carolina. We're fifty degrees clear. And uh, the sun has set, so it's dark out there now. Uh -oh. oh my! And uh, in Trent, in the Rose City, what are what are weather conditions like there, sir? Uh, forty nine and sunny for the next few days. Forty nine and sunny for the next few days. And uh, Gordon Lattenberg, Santa Clarita, California. You're getting some rain, I understand. Yeah, we have fifty eight degrees, and the rain's kind of tapered off. I did have a question. I was wondering whether that um, Blue Mountain grade is really steeper than Sema Hill. They're both right around 2.2. 2. Yeah, 2.21 2, and uh, going up Matanic Canyon in the Blues, 2.20 on Sema Hill. Mm. Sema is really dangerous, though, because of the lack of curves. Yeah, that's the big difference. And, and, and uh, you know, they've had three terrible runaways on Sema Hill. 
They've had zero runaways in the blues. And that's the difference between the Northwestern district safety and the mm. South Central district safety. Interesting. Yes, thank you, Dr. Leach, and that's a good point. Uh, just quickly before I let everybody go, Steve Howes in the Tri-Cities, what's it like there? 44 and cloudy. All right. I'm looking around the room, seeing what else I've, uh, well, I could always check with um, Michael Sawyer in Tacoma, Washington. What's it like in Tacoma this afternoon, Mad Dog, if you're there? Oh, he must not be. So, folks, um, about you got about the same weather I got. Oh, okay, okay. There you are. Yeah, sorry, didn't mean to to cut you off. So, um, uh, so I was across the room. Sorry. No worries. You're supposed to be sitting here watching. No, I'm kidding, of course. So I got I got chores to do, man. I understand. I, I got a few myself. You know, sure. some at Christmas shopping and this and that. So. I want to thank Dr. Leachman for being here. Rob, a fantastic program. Everybody really loved it. You've got some great stuff that we've talked about. Spoiler alert. I'm looking forward to the first quarter of 24 where we can get together. And, and I understand you've got some longer presentations that we'll want to do as part of a Cascade Rail Foundation presentation coming up in early 24 as well. So uh, again, thank you. And, and thank you to, to Firebug, George Foster, engineer on the Union Pacific operating over that same territory. George, it's always good to have you. Thank you. Always fun on the, on the grades. I can imagine. And so at this point, I'm going to say if uh, anybody's got anything more, now is a good time to bring it up. Go and I'd watch like to get movie. together with Rob sometime and... Uh and pick his brain about uh, uh, what kind of cars were used at various times in the 70s and the early 60s, uh, you know, in my modeling, but uh, I'll have to do that on, over the phone. So you, better yeah, come, I mean, you better come down to Paris in May. There you go. That's that might have to do that. In May. I don't know, all that warm weather. I'm not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all you, right. everybody, for being here today. Thank you. And uh, just a fabulous program. And I wish everybody a fantastic holiday weekend. And um, yes, as Eric just said, I hope everybody has a happy choo-choo underneath their tree. And we'll be yes, back I do. again, uh, weather and authorities permitting in 2024 on January 3rd with Chuck Sowell talking about railroading on the Northern Pacific in Thurston County, Washington. Cool. So in the Thanks, meantime- Jonathan. Ho, ho, ho. And going once, going twice. I'm going to say, I'm going to turn off the recording and say Merry Christmas to one and all. Bye for Thank now, you. everybody.